In the last chapter, we looked at the basics of the R language, exploring arithmetic and using functions. This chapter discusses how we can load data from CSV files and Excel files and explore their content. Now we use a clean data set and chapter seven shows you how to clean dirty data. To start, you need to open the relevant scripts, which you can find in the scripts folder on the 03-dataframes.r. When we open that, you see a lot of uh, bits of commentary in there. Now, for this case study, I've created fake water quality data that has a lot of special issues in it. Otherwise, there wouldn't be much to report on. So this is not real data and all the town names, et cetera, are totally made up. The R language out of the box in the base system has the read.csv function. And this function, um, as it says, reads the CSV file, and then you can store that in a variable, in this case, lab data. All the data for this course is in the data folder, and there is water underscore quality dot CSV. And a little note on typing file names. Also here, auto completion can come to the rescue. So if I want to find the water quality file, it will automatically pop up and R Studio knows which folder it lives. Now, before we continue, I will clean the memory by clicking on the broom icon in the environment. Okay. So if I run this piece of code, I get a variable named lab data, which has 2,422 observations of seven variables. And this is the data we're going to use for the next few chapters. The tidyverse has its own uh, functions to read CSV files. And I recommend using these because they are a little bit faster and they are better at recognizing variable types. So, to do that, we load the tidyverse, which was already loaded, so I don't get any feedback. And then uh, instead of read.csv in tidyverse, it's read underscore csv. It's a subtle difference, but it's a totally different function. So let's read it that way. I'll click on lab data, a little spreadsheet type presentation opens up a table. And in here we can scroll through and see what the data roughly looks like. So it looks pretty straightforward. We have a column with sample numbers. We have dates, a sample point ID, a suburb name, a measure, which is either THM, E. coli, turbidity, or chlorine, a result, and some units, a typical water quality data set. Now I can't edit these values, and that is a good thing because one of the principles of data science is never ever manually change your raw data because doing so um, means that it's very hard for anyone later on or for yourself to find out what was changed manually and which could um, jeopardize data integrity. Let's close this off. We can also read Excel files. And in this repository, there is a little Excel file, but it has a slightly different structure, like a typical Excel file might look. So if we go to the data folder, and then we can open the Excel file, water quality underscore XLSX. Let's, okay, it's downloaded, open. And there we go. What we see here, uh, this data set has two rows which have no data in it, and then our data set appears. Also, it's not in the first tab. We have a summary tab, and then there's a data tab. So I want to read that tab and not another one. So back to our studio. I need to load the library read XL, which is a special library for reading Excel files. And the function name for that is read underscore Excel. We then put in the name of the file. I need to use some additional options. So in this case, I need to say skip equals two because I want to skip the first two rows. Now for each Excel file, that might be different, of course. 
particular sheet we want to read is data. So if I do this, I get exactly the same result, which is here my lab data. Okay. What now happens if I just uh, type lab data and then evaluate that? I can see a summary of what is um, just read into memory. I have lab data, which is a TIVL, the tidy first way of saying data frame. Then we have a sample number, a date, a sample point, suburb, and all these very, very, uh, all these variables you saw earlier. It only shows so a table sort of tidyverse only shows the first ten rows. If you read the CSV file with a standard um, function, and let's just quickly do that, and we then go to lab data, I will display the first one thousand rows. So it's it's a less convenient way of displaying the data, and therefore. I prefer to use tibbles. One of the reasons I prefer to use tibbles. There are various functions to explore this data frame. I can get a vector of all the variable names, which might be useful in some cases. For example, if you want to rename them, um, we can get the dimensions if you want to know how many columns and rows are available. But we also have n row and n col. And we'll see some of those used later on. the dplyr package of the tidyverse, the glimpse function is very useful. It's a different way of displaying the data and especially useful if you have a lot of columns because this function effectively rotates, so pivots the data frame and it shows um, all each column in a row. So we have the sample number, which is a DBL that is a, a number, which means a double byte number. And here we have the first few values, then we have some dates, and the read underscores v automatically recognizes these as dates, and they are put a hundred years into the future, a hundred years after my my year of birth, um, just to ensure that everybody understands that these are not real dates. Then we have the sample point, the suburb, the measure, the result, uh, the, and the measure, they are characters, so these are strings. Then we have another number, which is the result, and another character string, which is the result, or the units. Okay, so now how can we know, how can we now use this data? Now to do that, we use the dollar sign. Well, let's remove this for a second. If I have lab data and I type dollar sign, and it gives me a completion menu of all the columns that are available. And also some of the values, they are not very visible in this um, particular theme, but that's okay. So for example, we will pick the result. When I hit enter, we have lab data dollar sign result. If I evaluate this with control enter, I get a vector of all the results that are in this data set. But R only shows the first 1000, so it omitted 1422 entries. Can do calculations with this result, right? I can, for example, say um, mean of um, lab data dollar sign result, and I get an average value, which doesn't mean much because we have um, lots of different units in here. But anyway, that's this is an example. If we only want, for example, the first ten uh, measures, we use this semicolon, and the semicolon gives us um, the numbers one to 10 between square brackets. And then we have the first 10 results or whatever you fancy. For example, if you want only result number one, three and five, we put this within a collection to create a little vector. So we create this little vector of one, three, five, put it between square brackets and then take the result. Another way of finding information is by using the name of the column. Now I have a comma here, and there's not and there's no dollar sign. So to subset the whole data set, I again use square brackets. And let's go actually add another one in here. Lab data, square brackets, and let's say um, row twelve and variable three. So the first number is the row, and the second variable is the column. So lab data twelve three gives me the twelfth row. And the third variable, which happens to be a sample point with this number. If I don't 
add anything before or after the comma, it means everything. So lab data comma date means give me the date variable and all the rows. So now I'm getting a vector of 2,422 dates. And the first, um, the diff and this then becomes a new table. So it's displayed as a table with 2,422 rows in one column and um, tidyverse will show the first 10 rows. And then we can combine all these types of things to, to subset the data the way you want. We can, of, co of course, also use um, arithmetic to calculate columns. So if we assume that we have a variable n and we um, assign that to the value 10, then we can say n times 2. So here's another way of, um, of, of using that information. For this particular way of filtering, you need to know the row numbers or the column numbers. There are more convenient ways. Now, what we can do is thing like this. So lab data and then square brackets. And in my rows, I have a separate expression where we say that the measure in the lab data data set equals, and we use a double equal sign in the R language, turbidity. So if I evaluate this separately, I get a vector with trues and falses, values. True is where the measure equals stability and false is where it's not. So if I put that vector before the comma, I get all the rows where the measure equals stability and I get all the columns. So evaluating this will give me a new data frame of all the turbidity measures. Neatly displayed here as a table, the first 10 rows, and as you see, they are only turbidity values. That is the base R way of doing so. And in a few moments, I'll show you how to do that within tidyverse. But before that, a little bit about conditionals. So how do we create these sort of expressions? So let's assume we have a variable and it has the numbers. So the variable A up here in the environment, it is an integer with two values, one and two. If I evaluate a equals one, I get a new vector, which happens to be true and false, because the first value equals two and the one other one doesn't. An exclamation mark and then an equal sign means not equal to. So a not equal to one will result in a false true vector. That's a little bit about um, using conditionals in the R language. As we see in a moment, we can also use ands and or to create um, complex structures. Filtering within the tidyverse, there is a function called filter, which, by the way, overrides the base function filter, which works slightly different. So the filter version in tidyverse in the dplyr package, the first parameter in that function is the name of the data frame, lab data in this case, comma. And I want the measure to equal turbidity. And I'm placing that in a new data frame called turbidity. So evaluating this gives me a new data frame with the 734 observations where the measure equals stability. I can make that as complex as I want. So I can say filter lab data where the suburb equals Tarnstad and the measure equals THM. And the result is larger than 0.1. And now I also get a result. And this tells me that in Tarnstadt, there were two THM measurements that were greater than 0.1. You might notice the text of this particular code goes uh, across the screen, it makes it a bit less easy to read. So what we can do is actually hit enter after the and symbol, and I'll demonstrate what our studio does. If I now hit enter after measure, it automatically places it at a convenient location. And every time I hit enter, they are all right underneath each other. So this is a convenient way of building up these, um, these lines of code to prevent them being very long. And this makes it a bit easier to read. If I then, for example, want to count the number of the variables where this is the case, um, I wrap that into the nrow function. And now 
tells me that there are 75 observations where the suburb is not Strathmore and the measure of stability and the result is less than 0.1. So that's a first way of counting data. The R language also has some counting functions. We can measure the length of a um, vector with the length function. We can also show all the unique um, values in a vector. Now in this case, I have the unique function of all the measures. And if I run this, it will only show me each of the values once. If I, of course, evaluate this separately, I get all the values. So unique is often a good way to quickly have a look what is available in a vector. A more advanced way is to use the table function, which is a base R function. And if I say table lab data dollar sign measure, I get a little table that tells me that there are 760 chlorine totals, 760 E. coli, 168 THMs, and 734 turbidity measurements. You can make that more complicated by uh, combining two variables. So in this case, this tells me the number of samples for each measure uh, for each suburb in this um, in this data set. Now the output of this function is a specific type of variable called table, which makes it a bit harder to, to work with to do subsequent um, evaluations. So the dplyr library in Tidyverse has the count function. I say count lab data suburb comma measure. You see here that we don't have to use the dollar signs. So there's less repetition in my code, makes it a bit cleaner to read. But also the count function in dplyr, the output is a data frame, which makes it easy. I can now store that in another variable and for example, can start um, doing further analysis after this step. So here's an example, how we can combine now start combining what we've learned and create some outcomes. So first I'm creating or recreating in this case, the turbidity data frame. Then I'm creating a new data frame, which is turbidity count. And I'm counting the turbidity data frame by suburb. And the name of the counting variable shall be samples. And then I can view this. And now we see there's or 105 samples. So for for example, if this is what I would want to know, I could say turbidity count, I'll assign samples, and I want the mean of that, and I get 104.8. So here's an example of how subsequent steps can lead um, uh, drive your analysis. So one more thing about um, Two more things about data frames. Uh, let's say I have a sample count, which in this case is a count of all the, of each um, result that's available by sample point. So here's my table, sample point and N. So you see, if I don't use the name function within count, it, it defaults to N. But I could, for example, say name equals Now my data frame has a new variable, another variable called samples. You can also arrange that by count. And uh, this will then show me by default. Um, from the lowest to the highest, the number of samples. If I want to reverse that, I need to put the N in the desk function. So disk decreasing. So I'm arranging the sample count data frame and the N needs to be decreasing. So now my most used um, data frame here is on top. Slice max is another uh, function. And basically what that does, it gives me the top three most used data frames. I see what does. <laughs> I created a, a bug here because I renamed my n to samples. So it's a great little example. Let's remove this. 
and do this again. So now I have a variable n. Uh, I can arrange it. I can arrange it reversed, so 82 to 75. And slice max is a handy function. I'm slicing the sample counts where n equals 3, so the top 3, and I'm ordering by n. So here are my top 3 sample points. A little bit advanced, uh, just a little hint of what you can also do. You can also filter by regular expression. Now, a regular expression is a bit like a wildcard, but more complicated. And just as a teaser, we can filter the lab data. And there is another library within Tidyverse called Stringer, which is for string manipulation. So we can say, detect the string within suburb and take all the suburbs that start with an M. So the caret symbol there means starts with. And if I now filter this, I'm getting only suburbs that start with M, which happen to be Merton. If you want to know more about regular expressions, use vignette regular expressions, and you'll see there's you can create very complex queries this way to sample your data sets. About this, then feel free to purchase my book, Data Science for Water Utilities. Also, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or comments. In the next chapter, we're going to look at generating descriptive statistics from this data set. Thank you for your time.